Hey, Brian. Thank you for coming to the VIP Home Podcast. So grateful to have you today. As I said, this is Brian O'Connor from the NFPA. And today we're going to be talking about lithium batteries. Yeah, very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Brian, how long have you been with the NFPA and what got you started and in, in you know this industry? Yeah, so a little background myself. I've been at NFPA for eight years now. And it's flying by. Uh, but how I got my start into the fire protection industry in general, uh, my dad's a New York City firefighter. So I kind of always grew up with some fire safety in the house, um, you know, did mechanical engineering for my undergraduate. And I feel like it was just the next logical conclusion uh, to go into fire protection. I think it's really easy to think about, you know, all the things we do for fire and life safety. You know, I'm, I'm able to think of, OK, firefighters, I know a lot of them um, think about their safety because ultimately they're the ones who do put a lot of risk and lives on the line. Uh, to respond to these incidents, but also anyone, right? Like friends and family, I want them all to be safe. I think that's great motivation to try to make sure that we are keeping people safe, doing it in a realistic manner that people can actually achieve, you know, not saying, all right, get rid of everything that could potentially be dangerous everywhere. Uh, you know, we want to make things realistic, make things safe and try to move forward. So we can embrace new technologies, uh, make people a little bit safer, make devices a little bit easier for people to use. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my background. Okay, awesome. So we're here today to talk about, as I had mentioned, lithium batteries. Why are they so dangerous? Yeah, absolutely. And then first I'll mention lithium batteries and lithium ion batteries are kind of two separate things. Lithium batteries are kind of these lithium metal one-time use batteries, something like a double A battery. Actually, they make lithium double A batteries. Mm -hmm. um, and then lithium ion battery are these rechargeable batteries that we're seeing, you know, infiltrate everywhere. They use like a lithium salt, which is a little bit different than lithium, like you, the metal you'll see on the table of elements. Um, that's like a highly reactive metal. Lithium salts are kind of like a, a kind of the difference between sodium and, and table salt is the difference between lithium metal and lithium ions that they use in these rechargeable batteries. Um, but the thing that makes them dangerous is the same thing that makes them useful, right? They have a lot of energy in a small envelope. So the fact that that makes them incredibly useful for our cell phones, watches, laptops, electric vehicles. You know, we, we can put them in a ton of things to provide electrical power when we need it. But the bad part is when these release that energy uncontrolled, that's when we can generate uh, toxic and flammable gases. We can create a lot of heat. We can create an explosive atmosphere. So there are a lot of bad things that can happen, mm -hmm. but it's tough because that's the trade-off for the benefits of this technology. And I will say too, I, I don't want to, you know, scare everyone with this because you know, as I'm here, I'm surrounded by six to eight lithium ion batteries as we speak. Um, the probability of these things happening, if you're using them correctly, if you have your properly listed batteries is pretty low. I think they estimate, you know, one in a hundred million is, is going to be the failure rate for these batteries. So I don't want to make this a scare tactic either, because I know this is something that we see everywhere. We do, we do. And it, and it is scary, but you know, keep them plugged in when they should be plugged in, unplug them, you know, do you, would you say to unplug them when you're going to bed at night, any of them? I mean, people charge their phones at night, you know, put them away out of sight unless you're, you know, on, on call 24 seven. Yeah. So ultimately they shouldn't be charging all the time. And this is the true for any lithium ion battery powered device. They, they should be charged using the charger that they came with because, you know, different batteries need different charging rates. Uh, some might have battery management systems that can allow it to charge a little bit quicker than other things. Um, so we want to make sure that the charger and the battery are compatible. Otherwise, you could heat that battery up a little bit too much. It causes a, like a short circuit basically inside of it mm -hmm. and it generates that heat and flammable gas and kind of leads to something. We call it thermal runaway because it really heats up and it's really hard to cool down and it spreads to adjacent battery cells um, and causes a, a fire or an explosion. Um, right. So yeah, ultimately, if you are charging them, I'd say don't charge them overnight, you know, un pl unplug them. If they are fully charged, there's no reason to leave something charging all the time. Um, it just kind of opens you up for a little bit more probability of something bad happening. Okay, good to know. So are lithium ion battery fires even more dangerous than other house fires due to all the toxic gases and the extreme heat that, you know, we're talking about right now that can happen? Yeah, so I think the big differentiator is the fact that lithium-ion battery fires can spread really quickly. When we have these lithium-ion battery fires, 
they basically, you know, you have like your battery cell, think of something like a double A battery, it pressure, it, it heats up when it starts to fail, and it pressurizes with a flammable gas. And mm -hmm. as soon as that flammable gas is released, I mean, think of, you know, uh, a, a lighter that breaks in half, it, it creates a very quick gas fire. So um, that's able to spread to adjacent cells, it can also, you know, eject those cells into other parts of the room. So you can have like a multiple point fire. Um, so the fact that these things can happen so quickly is really what what makes them dangerous. Uh, because again, any fire can grow into a big, hot, toxic gas fire. Um, but these just happen so quickly, we don't have a lot of time to react. And that's where we see the, the additional hazard of these. Right. So how can homeowners protect themselves from the dangers of these lithium ion batteries? So it wouldn't just be your typical lithium battery, then it would really just be the lithium ion ones. Yeah. So I'd say the biggest thing is to make sure you're buying a listed, properly tested battery because they go through a lot of testing to make sure that they can, you know, survive impacts, that they can survive different temperature ranges, that they aren't going to just cause fires here and there. Um, so making sure that you purchase properly, you know, listed and tested and approved batteries, and then follow the manufacturer's instructions. The manufacturer of these batteries know what they're talking about. They have to, right? They want their right. product to, to do well. Um, so make sure that you're using the charger, you're charging it within the temperature limits. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are some other small things you can do. And it's kind of, once you think about it enough, starts becoming a little bit more common sense to say, don't store them, you know, anywhere they can fall downstairs or you can trip over them. And that's happens with like electric bikes and stuff. Um, you know, try to keep them in a safe location because things that can start these batteries failing and starting to catch on fire is any physical damage. So again, puncturing them, crushing them, dropping them too hard, uh, temperature damage. So either hot or too cold, charging them incorrectly. Uh, those are probably the main ones that are going to affect our batteries and cause them to start going into thermal runaway and start a fire. So trying to avoid those at all mm -hmm. costs. Um, yeah. So and then something oh, else I was just, mind. yeah, I was just going to say, you know, you're talking about extreme heat or, mm -hmm. you know, the other extreme cold. So if somebody is charging something, let's just say in their garage and mm -hmm. it's not temperature controlled, can that pose a greater risk with fluctuating temperatures? Or should yeah. they be pretty safe? I'd say, keep in mind, look at your manufacturer's instructions. They're going to tell you the exact limit just because different batteries might have right. different specific chemistries in them. Um, but again, that temperature range is typically between freezing and maybe like 120 degrees. So mm -hmm. if your temp if your garage is going to be that all the time and you live in a pretty moderate climate, you know, I'm thinking like England, right? They, they don't get too hot, don't get too cold. That's probably fine. But if you're living out in Arizona and your garage is unconditioned, it's going to get pretty hot in there. Um, so yeah, if you do go beyond those limits, that's when it really increases the risk of a fire. Right. So we've all heard of hoverboard fires. There's actually in 2016, I'm in Chicago, there was one in a surrounding suburb that, um, you know, when it hits closer to home, it just, it, it impacts you in a different way, hearing it on the news versus seeing it live, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, how could a hoverboard enthusiasts have stopped this from happening? And what are some tips for, for charging them? Yeah, so I think there's probably two main things that things like and those are those self-balancing scooters, very similar to regular electric scooters or something, because they, they have a big battery pack in them. Right. Um, those, I think, in particular, are, are susceptible to people doing tricks on them, right? So they're a little bit more susceptible to being physically damaged if someone falls on them or crashes them a bit. Uh, but again, the first one would be having your properly listed and labeled batteries. I think a lot of those fires stem from kind of the cheap knockoffs that you say, oh, I want whatever the main brand is, but eh, maybe I'll get a cheaper one, see if I like it, and then I'll buy a nicer one if I like it. And so those cheaper ones that might've cut a little bit of corners in manufacturing and assembly, that's where we did see a lot of those hoverboard fires. Uh, and then secondly, just if I lost the charger for it, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to go on, you know, uh, the internet and try to find a cheap replacement? That's probably what you're going to do, especially because these things are, you know, a little bit less expensive. We, right. we don't see that mirrored with electric vehicles because mm -hmm. you're not going to go, oh, let me find the cheapest thing I possibly can to charge my $40,000 or $60,000 car, right? You're going to have something a little bit better for that. 
Right. No, for sure. So are you guys seeing more fires with these types of, I'm going to call them toys for lack mm. of a better word, um, <laughs> um, when they're plugged in or can they also happen when they're not being charged? Yeah. So I think first we see there's, there's definitely a sliding scale of how mobile these battery powered devices are. So like mm -hmm. your cell phone, your watch, or like you can bring absolutely everywhere. Meanwhile, right. you have, you know, the bigger they get, the harder they are to move around. By the time you get something like, you know, look at those Tesla power walls, which are some big mounted units, but we know where they're going to be, right? They're stationary and we can kind of protect around them. Mm -hmm. uh, so once we get these medium sized devices, whether they're electric bikes, hoverboards, electric scooters, mm -hmm. that's when they still have a big battery pack, but you can still pretty much bring them wherever you want. Um, right. So that's where we're seeing a lot of issues uh, and they can have issues charging or not charging the the correlation between the difficulty of the fire directly relates to the state of charge so if it's 100 percent charge that's where you're going to have the biggest most destructive you know failure so a mm -hmm. fire or explosion but if it's only you know say 30 percent charge you're going to see a lot less it's going to look very similar to just a plastics fire at that point um because it has about that yeah it has less energy in it so charging you're going to have more 100 percent charge things probably on the charger right and so that's kind of that correlation it's more about um you know the state of charge of the battery but mm -hmm. they're much more likely to be charged when they're on the charger right so right so we do see more incidents there so if people want to dispose of say a regular battery versus a lithium ion battery mm -hmm. where should they dispose them how should they be doing it is there a special container is there a special drop off what, you know where do you start with that Yep. So, and there's kind of two paths to you know getting rid of these batteries, right? The first one is my, my cell phone's not holding a charge, right? The battery just, it, it, it's at its end of life. It's only charging and holding it for 10 minutes. At that point, bring it to a recycling center. Uh, your big box stores like your Home Depot or Lowe's, they all mm -hmm. accept those because most battery powered tools, uh, you know, your, your power tools are going to have lithium ion batteries. So they say, hey, you know, we sell them. We can also take them back and recycle them. Um, so I'd say that's probably the best course of action uh mm -hmm. definitely check out your department of waste management because they might have also some sort of recycling center nearby for those but when you have a fire that's when it's much more difficult to uh to dispose of these contact your fire department and contact your waste management department because those are going to be your uh resources to figuring out how to get rid of one of these batteries that has caught on fire right Okay, so what are some warning signs that a battery may be close to exploding? Like, is it going to be hot? Are you going to smell something coming from it? Is there, what are those warning signs? Or are yeah, so, <laughs> so there are a few warning signs. Uh, the first one you probably would notice before anything else would be the smell. Um, again, it has a very strong smell and it's kind of toxic. So if you smell it, you don't want to be smelling it. You want to get out of there. Um, they also start to kind of inflate because uh, when there's a lot of heat generation in there, the electrolyte turns into a gas. And just like when you boil water, the gas, it takes up more volume than the solid. So it's going to, you know, puff out a bit. So you'll see it start to expand, mm -hmm. um, you know, smoke, of course, if you see any smoke or white gas coming out of it, that's a, one of those signs. Um, another sign though, that it is starting to fail and is starting to kind of catch on fire is a popping noise. Uh, these batteries, they, they pressurize and then they pop and it's pretty mm -hmm. loud. So if you're in your house and you start hearing these popping noises, that's something you should definitely investigate. And it, it might be a sign that these battery systems are, are, are catching on fire, um, especially because sometimes these battery systems, they don't want to be damaged, right? So they're going to be encased in a plastic container. They might even have another metal container on top of that. So there might be a couple layers of protection between you and the battery. So you might not be able to directly see these things. But if you start hearing them, smelling them, those are some indications that one, evacuate your house because your life is more important than any of the things around you and your right. family. So, so evacuate first, call the fire department and then see what they can do. Even if nothing has started, like you don't want to grab that device, just let it be and get out. Yes, exactly. It's really hard to tell when that pressurized vessel is going to burst. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. you, it does, you don't want that in your hand when that happens. Um, it really has kind of a blowtorch effect. You you can look look at videos on YouTube and you'll see, you know, whenever these batteries fail, there's always one point. It starts shooting out a lot of gas. It usually catches on fire and it, it really looks like a blowtorch. Um, yeah. So you don't want that in your hand or in your pocket or anywhere near you when that happens. 
So do all of these risks also apply to electric vehicles, you know, like Teslas and Priuses and all of that, you know, while you're charging them? And Yeah, they, def they definitely do. Um, I think there are less likely to have, you know, poorly made mm -hmm. battery cells in electric vehicles because they rely on these things working. They rely on them to get you there and they're expensive, right? So they're going to make sure that they, they build them correctly and they last a long time. Uh, right. So I do think the failure rate for electric vehicles is going to be significantly lower than uh, some sort of other cheaper battery powered device that you might have some knockoffs of, or you might not have listed batteries inside of. So uh, the hazard's still there. It's it's a little bit less likely to happen, but because there are more battery cells, it's also going to be a bigger implication. Um, you know, if there's an electric vehicle fire in your garage, which there has been you know, several times, um, it's much more likely to kind of burn down that garage, maybe burn down your house because those batteries can create a, a, a very fast growing fire. Right. So do they, do the electric vehicles need certain uh, electrical outlets to be charged yes. in or can, you know, just a regular outlet work? So I'm not familiar with every single brand of electric vehicle, <laughs> but for the most part, uh, yeah, you should get an electrician to install a specific charger. So, you know, if you have a Tesla, if you have a Nissan, if you have a Toyota, whatever the, the charger you need for your vehicle, which mm -hmm. I think they're getting to all the same charger, kind of like our cell phones, which is nice. a good thing, you know, <laughs> we just see that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you want a, a professional qualified engineer or electrician to install this in your house. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I I don't play with uh, wires and, and electrical yeah. points in my house. I don't recommend anyone <laughs> do that. Um, so yeah, making sure that they're properly installed, uh, and, and yeah, they, they'll take care of all the safety precautions for that. And then do electric vehicles also have the same issues with extreme heat or extreme cold? I know we you know, touched about that a little bit, but um, should you- So ultimately or? the batteries do. Uh, batteries on electric vehicles have a little bit more advanced battery management system. Um, like, you know, particularly a lot of electric vehicles might have a cooling system that goes in the battery itself is integrated. So- Mm -hmm. They might be able to have a, a wider range of temperatures than, say, a, a hoverboard or an electric bike or something. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely depends on the manufacturer by manufacturer, but they still have the limits. Those limits just might be a little bit different on your electric vehicle. For sure. So is there anything we haven't discussed that you feel that our audience listening or watching should know about lithium ion batteries? I think just the biggest thing is being aware that it is a hazard. I think a lot of people just don't think about it, you know, and, and they might store their, you know, electric vehicle, not electric vehicle, but electric bike or scooter, or, you know, might have a camping big battery pack. You might be storing those in your bedroom. You might store them next to a door. Don't do that. Uh, I'd say make sure that if the event, one of these things does happen, that you're able to get out of your house, get out of your apartment, um, leave safely store them in places they're not going to get damaged they're not going to get too hot or too cold use the correct charger um i think those are kind of the main takeaways uh nfpa does have some public education tools so if you are say a landlord or someone wants to educate my school or something else on this we have some resources for that so check out you know nfpa.org slash ebikes is a good one for medium-sized lithium-ion battery powered devices um but yeah i think that's it ultimately be aware we don't treat propane cylinders the same way we treat batteries, but we might start needing to do that because they have similar flammability characteristics once, right. once you get down to it. Right. Well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to have you back in the future. And this was all very valuable information. Great. Happy to be here. Thanks so much. Yeah. Have a great day.